Good morning, everybody. So glad to have you here this morning. God bless you. May the God of all grace and the God of all peace certainly keep you. Thank you for joining us this morning for Life Change of Faith uh, broadcast here uh, live streaming. My prayer this morning is that you have enjoyed Sunday School as I have and pray that you will continue to continue with Sunday School, allowing yourself to get up to hear the word of God. And so thank you this morning and blessings to all of you, those of you that are personal members and those of you that watch via uh, uh, Life uh, Facebook Live. I am so excited today to bring you forth the Word of God that's able to change our lives and help us to accomplish the things that God has called us to accomplish. And so we're going to pray this morning. Good morning to all of you. Good morning to D-May. Good morning, uh, Jan. Um, good morning, uh, uh, Jackie and Carl Watson and all those that are tuning in. I want you to understand the importance of prayer. We have been preaching for the last two weeks on prayer. I will continue on prayer as this is part three. And my prayer is, is that you are listening to the messages and that you are applying them in your life so that you can carry out the mandates of God without confusion or fear. And so this morning, we're going to get right into the word of God. We're going to go into prayer. And then after prayer, we are going to we are going to get into God's word. Wow. I am so excited into the word of God. Blessings to all life changing faith members. God bless you. We're praying that you're doing well and staying safe and that the power of the blood and the blood of Jesus Christ is keeping you, your family and all those connected to, with you from all hurt, harm and danger. Even when you have to go out shopping or go to the store, that the blood of Jesus Jesus is covering you and that your faith is in God Almighty. So this morning, let's get started and let's get right on into prayer. Father, we thank you. We bless you this morning. We give you praise and we give you glory for allowing us this opportunity this morning to just be alive. Lord God, to be in the land of the living. Lord God, to have our right minds and praying, Lord, that we have really uh, applied ourselves to renewing our minds by hearing the word of God because the Bible said faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God and so my prayer this morning is that every believer every person watching Lord will get the importance of this message that you have given me I pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord, as we go forward, Lord God, that there's no separation between us. There's no there's no uh, brokenness in the body of Christ that we're all supporting and praying and working together for the good of the kingdom of God. And so, Father, in Jesus name, I certainly pray for all my brothers and my sisters, my leaders, the elder and all those that's involved. Lord God, I want to thank you and I want to bless you, Lord God. And I also ask you to forgive us of our sins. Lord, forgive us of our sins as we confess our sins. Lord, let us know it's important to confess your sin in the name of Jesus so we can receive, Heavenly Father, forgiveness, forgiveness of our sins and that there's nothing in our lives that's hidden. There's nothing in our lives, Lord God, that will prevent us from prospering in you and in spiritual knowledge and understanding. And so I pray this morning in Jesus' name, Lord God, that we confess our sins so we can be healed in the name of Jesus as, and certainly as we pray for one another. So bless this message today, Lord God. I ask you in Jesus' name, Lord God, to use me as your tool this morning, for I am their servant to bring them forth this food, the word of God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Blessings to you all. We are still on prayer is essential. And I definitely want to talk about prayer this morning. And I, I really want to get into your heart and your soul and your mind the importance of establish a prayer life with God. It, the importance of really looking at prayer more much differently than you looked at it uh, previously. That you will understand that, that, that prayer is so powerful because we are literally talking to the creator of the universe. We're talking to the designer of man. We're, we're talking to the God that said and it, and it became. And so this morning when I, when, I, when I pray, when I go before the Lord, in my mindset, I am in the very presence of God. And from, and from a heart and, for, and from a, 
a, a position that God's will is being done and that I'm literally praying according to God's will. A part of God's will is that we pray one for another, that we all may be healed. Uh, another uh, part of God's will is that we forgive because he said, if you forgive, then you shall be forgiven. And I'm telling you, I, I, I pray for my brothers and sisters and I, and I pray that you don't allow the enemy to use you and put thoughts in your mind about your brother or your sister or anyone that we are really trusting God's word and praying for our brother and praying for our sisters even if they're not living right we're going to get on our face and labor and pray for our brothers and our sisters and before I get into the word of God I, I just want to really stress that there have been many works that we have done many things that that we have 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 done in ministering and teaching and it has not been uh, uh, done with labor intensive prayer. Sometimes people just go study and then they come in and do a lesson. I've done it. I've done it on um, previous times and haven't uh, seriously given really intimate time and fervent prayer to what God has called me to do. And so though we may experience some success uh, without praying, I'm telling you, it is it is hard. But when you pray, God always makes provision and God always gives favor uh, when we uh, include him in the things that hopefully he called us to do and that we're not just doing them, trying to impress people, trying to get people to follow us, trying to get influence. Do you know if you just learn to trust God and live according to his mandate, God will give you influence. God will give you favor. You don't have to put down somebody else to exalt yourself. And so I'm realizing more than ever that what keeps my attitude in check, which keeps my character in check is my time with God because because anytime you come into the presence of God and start praying, God always exposes you to yourself. God exposes even the secret things in your life that hopefully in acknowledging them, you can get healed from it and you can enjoy this journey for which God has called us on. So this morning, turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1 through 7. And I'm talking about prayer. Prayer is, is essential. It is essential that we, everything that we do, we labor it with prayer. Like I said, I'm going down to East Over, haven't been there for a couple of weeks, but I was going because God told me, but I never labored in prayer for the people that we would be dealing with, uh, the prostitutes, the homosexuals, the uh, uh, drug addicted, alcoholism, mentally ill. You cannot go down there in your own power. You cannot go down there just because you are a believer. I'm telling you, the church needs to wake up and the church needs to get back in line with the word of God. And we do that simply by prayer. I'm telling you, prayer is essential. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 20, 1 through 7, I'm going to read those verses first. And the Bible, and the Bible states as the history of Hezekiah at this point. It said, in those days, Hezekiah was sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, thus saith the Lord. Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. I mean, man, this is probably the worst news that anybody could ever receive. And he received it from God's prophet Isaiah. And so when the prophet of God came to King Hezekiah, he respected Hezekiah because he knew that he was a prophet of God. <laughs> And he told him to set his house in order. Get your affairs right because you are about to die. And he said, he certainly said, thou shall not live. Look at verse number two. Then he, Hezekiah, turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Who did he pray to? The Lord saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah 
wept sore, the Bible says. That means that Hezekiah wept before the Lord and, and, and probably in his weeping, he was praying this prayer. And he was not only reminding God of, of, of what he has done, but Hezekiah didn't want to die. And so he petitioned God. He petitioned God for what? Life and healing because he was sick unto death. Look at the next verse, number four. And it came to pass a four, Isaiah was gone out into the middle court. And the Lord came unto him saying, so as, 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 as Isaiah had, was leaving, he went out into the middle court and God met him there. Look what he said. Number five. He said, turn. Uh, he said, turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father. I have heard thy prayer. This is powerful. This is so powerful. He's <laughs> excuse me. He said, I have heard thy prayer. God said to God, the creator of the universe, the God that, that said, <laughs> excuse me, and it was. He said, I have heard thy prayer. So what Hezekiah said in verse three, he is now telling Hezekiah, I heard what you said. Look what he said here. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day. Thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. So he's telling Isaiah what to tell Hezekiah. He said, tell him to go up to my house on the third day because I was going to heal him. And this is so powerful because God said, I, I, I heard what Hezekiah, he's talking to Isaiah. And he says, I heard his, his, his prayer. He said, I have seen his tears. I mean, God cares. Excuse me. <coughs> God cares. And so God, for his namesake, for his namesake, uh, uh, is going to heal Hezekiah. But let me read. Let me finish reading this. Number six. And I will add unto thy days 15 years. Glory be to God. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my David's sake. And what happened, the king of Assyria sent his messenger to Hezekiah and told him that he was going to destroy uh, uh, Hezekiah's kingdom that God had set up. And so he kept sending his sending these servants and 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 about what he was going to do to King Hezekiah. And so if you go back and you read the other chapters, you will find out with this long discourse. But but God said, I'm going to defend this city for my own uh, 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 desire. And I'm going to use you, Hezekiah, to be my point man. But I want you to know that God never did. Uh, deny that uh, Hezekiah had walked before him in truth. He never denied that Hezekiah walked with him with a perfect heart. He never denied that Hezekiah did that which was good in God's sight. And so then God added 15 years to the life of Hezekiah. Verse number seven. And Isaiah said, to uh, uh, um, um, Hezekiah, he said, take a lump of fig and they took it and laid on a boil and he recovered. Hezekiah recovered. You know what I noticed about in this particular story? This is a prayer of life. He was he was asking God for his life and for healing is that Hezekiah didn't call his servants. Or even Isaiah, when he got the message from Isaiah that he was going to die. He did not call Isaiah and ask Isaiah to talk to God for him. He didn't call any of his servants and ask them to do anything. At this time, King Hezekiah relied on his past experience and victories that God has done. King Hezekiah had a death sentence on him, but God honored King Hezekiah. Listen to this. What did God honor in verse number three? God honored his obedience. 
Glory be to God. God honored Hezekiah obedience to his word. His obedience put him in a position that he could go back and tell God that I have walked before thee in truth. I have and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. Hezekiah could go back because he knew he was obedient. It is difficult to really pray sincerely when you have not been obedient to God's word. It is, it is difficult. It's very difficult, not almost impossible for you to go into the presence of God. Listen, into the presence of God, into the holiness of God. If you have not been obedient to his word, second point, or if you have not been repentive of your sins. It is difficult to go in and ask God uh, 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 to heal or ask God to deliver if you have not been obedient to God's word. What's obedience to God's word? It said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? All of thy heart, all of thy soul, and all of thy mind. What's the next one? Say, and thou shalt love. Now, we need to spend some time talking about what it does it mean to love thy neighbor as thyself. Because what I'm finding is that people believe that they can live any kind of way they want and do anything they want, but when trouble comes, and at some point in our lives, trouble do comes. At some point in our lives, if we live long enough, we will experience a death of a loved one, of a mother, of a father, of a sister, of a brother, of a close friend. But if you have, have inundated your life and you have put into place the most, the most uh, uh, um, uh, powerful thing that any believer can do, and that is pray, that is get, that you can go before the Lord. And if you're crying, God will see your tears. If, 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 if you're facing something uh, uh, difficult, you, your first thing should be turned to God. But when I'm finding people often go talk to other people and share with other people before they even talk to God. Hezekiah never did that. Hezekiah didn't call Isaiah back and say, hey, can you talk to God for me? Why? Because he knew he had a relationship with God. And so he could turn his face to the wall. He, is, he actually put into practice some of the principles that we should have been putting into practice. And I will cover those here in a minute. So he walked before the Lord in truth. He walked before the Lord with a perfect heart. And he did that which was good in his sight. No secret sins at all. Hezekiah simply obeyed God. And God honored his obedience by extending his life 50, 15 years and not only extending his life, but also healing him. And God gave, even God gave him the remedy for his sickness. Look down at uh, verse number uh, seven and Isaiah said take a lump of figs and they took it and laid it on a boil and it healed itself I mean God has a remedy for anything if we would trust him if we would go into where he is and trust him at his word and not just use God when when things start going bad I'm going to talk about that in the next example that I have I want you to turn your Bibles to Daniel I think it's Daniel. I want you to turn your Bibles to, no, I want you to turn your Bibles to um, Isaiah. Isaiah. First, no, 1 Samuel. Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel. That's where I want to be at. Turn your Bible to 1 Samuel. Um, and 30. 1 Samuel and verse 30. You need your Bible. There's no way that any of us will be able to rightly divide the word of truth or to exegete the word of God if we don't have our Bibles and to read it in, in such a way that it is speaking to us about a historical event 
that truly happened. These are not fairy tales. These are not stories made up by some man uh, put into a book. These are literal accounts of the journey of God's people to the promised land and in the promised plan. Listen to this that the Lord has given me. Prayer is not only essential, but prayer is life saving. Let me say that again. Prayer is not only essential in a believer's life, but prayer is life saving. It is life encouraging. It is life sustaining. Prayer is the key to our spiritual growth and our mental stability. You cannot enjoy or obey God to his fullest if you have not established a prayer life. If you have not established this time with God, I'm telling you the church have literally missed the, missed the uh, aspect of prayer. Prayer is so valuable. There are people that, that, that pray when only when things go bad. But I want to teach you along with other leaders to pray when things are good. And I'll explain why here in a minute. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, let's look at what happened to King David. King David was out in these battles and he was battling certain enemies. And so if you go back and you read uh, uh, um, in the prior books of, of 1 Samuel, you will find that David went out to conquer kings and he was busy conquering. And David didn't spend a whole lot of time in prayer at this particular point because he's out fighting. He's out defending uh, uh, Israel. He's out fighting the Philistines and the Hittites and the, and the Amorites. But as he goes out to fight, he goes out to protect God's people. Look what happened in 1 Samuel chapter 30. It says, verse number one, and it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag was smitten and burned with fire. So what happened, David had went out to fight and the Amalekites came. And then when they came, they destroyed certain cities. And so they came to Ziglag and they set it on fire. But look what it says in verse two. And the Amalekites had taken the women captives and uh, that, they, that they were in the city. They did not kill anyone, neither great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So when they came to the city, they didn't kill anybody. They just round them all up, however many people it was, set their, their buildings and their homes on fire, and they took them away. Verse number three. So David and his men came to the city. So when David and his men was coming back from the, from the battle, they looked up and they came to the city and look, they looking and it's on fire. It's like you at your house and you coming down your street and you look and your house is on fire. Look what happened. And, and the house was, uh, uh, it said they were, um, so David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. So when they give back, everything that they loved was gone. The enemy had taken them. Not only did they take them, they burned down their homes. Next verse, look what happened. Then David and the people that were with them lifted up their voice and started weeping until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever been in a situation in your life where, where things have started going wrong and difficult moments begin to rise up and boy, you just start crying and you start weeping or, or you've been let down so so hard that, that you start weeping and, I, and, and you had no more power to weep. They had no more tears that they could shed. They were, they, their, their wives and their children and their city were burned with fire and they began to weep. Next verse. And David, two wives were taken captive. Ahinoam, the, Je the Jezalite, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. Number six. 
And David was greatly distressed. At this particular moment, this is what I'm finding out about a lot of believers. When things go wrong, when, when you're praying, when you're praying for someone and it doesn't happen when you think it should happen, it said here, David came, he came distressed. Why? Why did David become distressed? He was God's chosen king. He went out to win battles. And David was defeating all the enemies. But the thing about it, if you go back and you start reading, you will find that David never had, from that point, he was busy fighting battles. He didn't spend no time with God. Look at the rest of this. And David was greatly distressed, and the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved. The souls of all the people said, look, we're going out doing God's will. We're going out defending Israel. We're going out fighting. We come back, and our wives are taken, and our children are taken, and our, high, and our homes are being burnt down. Have you ever said, I'm doing all this for God, and God, I'm, I'm living right, and, and God, I'm serving, and and God, I'm helping, and yet my home is a disaster. Yet, Lord, I don't seem to have enough money to pay my bills. Have you ever got to that point where you become distressed and, and, and overwhelmed by the circumstances of life? I'm going to talk about this in one second. And so the people were grieved, every man for his son and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. So guess what? Everybody's looking at David. Look, we're going out fighting with you. We're, we're going out defending Israel. And we come back and our wives and our children and our possessions are burned with fire. And, 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 and I'm telling you that the people are talked about stoning David. But the Bible says David encouraged himself. How did David bring himself back from a from a, a, a attitude of despair and an attitude of grief to the point that he he knew that he had to encourage himself? And so what did David do? At the time that you're facing hard situations, at the time you're trying to decide what job to take or, 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 or what to do in your family or, or how to deal with your wife, why is it that we always fall apart? Why is it that we allow grief and despair and fear to come in? Simply put it, you don't have a prayer life. You're not spending time with God. And because you're not spending time with God, you're not in the peace or the place of God where peace is. You're not in the place where God can give you instructions according to Proverbs 3 and 5. Proverbs 3 and 5 said these words, trust in the Lord. Oh, with what? All thy heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge God. What does that mean? That means pray to God. That means go to God. And the Bible says in praying and seeking God, he will direct your path. We have not done that. We have not fully followed God and had a prayer life because we're too busy working. We're too busy worrying about our bills. We're too busy worrying about the situation instead of going to the place that will give you strength. David reminded himself and encouraged himself. And people often read and say, oh, look, David. But what did David do? To encourage himself. Next verse. And David said to Abathar the priest, because David was a priest himself. Ambalich, son, I pray thee. He said, Bring me hither the earpole. And Abathar brought thither the earpole. The earpole was a priestly garment. It was a priestly garment that the priest had to wear before he even went into the presence of God. He had to put on the, the priest's clothing. He had to put on the priest's type of underwear. And then he had to put on the, the, the uh, 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 robe. And then he put on the ear pole. And then he had to put on the, 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 um, the uh, 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 a crown that went on his head that had the, tw had the 12 jewels of the tribe of, of, of Israel embedded in them. And so David got and put it on. Look what happened. Number eight, and David inquired at the Lord. So David went in and started talking to God about what was going on. So, so David, David went into the place where he knew he could get help. Let me stop right here for a minute. Um, up to this point, David had been in many battles. David turned to the one place. And that one place didn't require his army. 
It didn't require his experience. It didn't require weapons or anything. It only required him to simply submit and to come to that one place to get instructions for his strength. That one place to get mental stability. That one place to get encouragement was in the place where God was. And this is why so many believers, we make so many mistakes. We find ourselves doing a good work at the wrong time because you didn't labor. And so there's no fruit that comes out of it. There may be a little dribble here and there, but it's no real fruit. To the glory of God because we're trying to do it with man-made efforts without depending on God. Let me tell you something. Before you do any work, before you preach a sermon, before you do a teaching, you ought to labor in prayer that the Holy Spirit will deal with the hearts of those that the Holy Spirit is trying to draw. Not what you're trying to draw. Not what you're trying to get in your meeting. Not with, not with those that you're trying to get to listen to you, but the Bible says the Holy Spirit will draw them. And when the Holy Spirit draws them, you better believe that the word is going to go out and it's going to go on good ground. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is drawing and you're not using your influence. You're not using your ability. You're not using your experience. You're not using your friends. You're not using Facebook or YouTube. You're simply trusting in the Spirit of the Lord to do the work. And then you as the servant who has spent time in praying will then get instructions from God on how to proceed. So look at number eight. And David inquired at the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this truth? So David was seeking what? Direction. He started putting into practice Proverbs chapter three, verse five. What is that? Trust in the Lord. With all thy heart. David did not lean unto his own understanding. He acknowledged God and now he is receiving instructions by following the command. What was the command? Trust in the Lord. How do you trust in the Lord? You build relationships. How do you build relationship with God? By prayer. By, by trusting him at his word. Prayer gives you strength. Prayer gives you encouragement. Prayer sustains you mentally and spiritually. When you start praying, it does it does things that 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 no no sermon, no no Bible reading could ever do. Because prayer makes makes the word of God more open and enlightening an enlightenment to you when you start reading it. And not just reading it out of your own mind, out of your own flesh, but you're reading it under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. So David said, shall I overtake them? He didn't assume. David did not assume because he prayed that, that, that or, or he didn't pray. He could go out and whip the enemy. He asked God because God already know. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. God knows what happens 10 years from now. God, God already knows. Why don't we trust God? Simply because we don't have a prayer life. Because prayer requires faith. Prayer requires you to get out of yourself and trust God because he said it. So look what happened. He said, shall I pursue this truth? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him. Who answered him? God answered him. And God said, pursue. And thou shalt surely overtake them. And God said, without fail. And guess what God said? You're going to recover all, David, because you trusted me. And because you came to me, David, and you came to the place where you can really get help. He said, man, you prepared yourself to come in. He didn't go in there without the proper clothing. He didn't go in because at this time, the only way into God's presence was through the priest. The priest was the only one that could come into the presence of God. Nobody else could come into the presence of God. So in having on the ear pole and having on the crown with the 12 tribes of Israel embedded in it, where did David go? David went to the tabernacle of God. David went in where God's presence was. He went into the holies of holies, prepared, had on the ear pole, had on the right clothing, had the uh, crown with the 12 tribes embedded in it. And he went into God and he inquired. What are we supposed to do today? You going to God, repent of your sins. Not only repent, turn from sin. 
Confess your sins. Don't just say, Father, I, I, I say confess them. You know what they are. Individually name them off and ask God to forgive you. Let's do this thing right. Let's start getting answers to our prayer. Let's stop of going about life and wondering if God heard you. Let's stop going through life wondering if you're in God's will or am I am I'm in God's perfect will. Let's stop that. How do you stop that? You stop that by establishing a prayer life with God. It is where your strength is going to come from. It's where your direction is going to come from. You will know what to do and what not to do when you start praying. Verse number nine. In 1 Samuel chapter 30. So David went. So David, 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 God told him what to do. David went. And he and 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 he and the 600 men that were with him. And they came to the brick of Brashore where those that were left behind stayed. So David didn't take all 600 men. Because God don't want you sometimes to have a whole lot of people with you. Because then you'll start looking at the numbers of people with you. And you'll start relying on them to get you through. And so God cut it down. Look what happened. But David pursued he and 400. So from 600 men to 400 men for 200 abode behind, which were so tired and so weak that they could not go over the brook. Bayshore. This God. It's all God doing this. Drop down to verse number. Um, 18. And David recovered all and the Amalekites and carried away, were carried away. And David rescued his two wives. Listen to the answer prayer. And there was nothing. What the Bible says, there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. David did not recover all in his own strength. David did not recover all because of his mighty army. David did not recover all because he was so smart in battle. David simply recovered all, not because of his ability, not because of his army. He recovered all because he trusted in the arm of God and God gave David the victory. The problem with Christians today, you don't trust God to recover all. You try to work 20 jobs. You, you go and borrow money from people or borrow money from the bank and can't pay it back because you have no prayer life. You make wrong decisions. You, you, you go about life in the wrong way because believers don't even come to prayer service. They don't come to prayer service and it's the most emptiest service. But when something goes wrong and something happens, you think because you are a believer that guess what? It's going to turn around. No, baby. It's going to turn around when you trust in the living God. When you trust him with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. And when you stop leaning to your own understanding, then God can give you clear direction on what to do and where to go and and whether or not you shall recover all. The reason that many believers seemingly miss God's help is they refer to everyone else or they desperately try to correct or to fix it themselves instead of coming to God in prayer. We don't obey the Bible. Many people overlook the word of God. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, they, you, won't, you won't be taught. Until we as men and women are learn to submit to God's word and submit to God's authority, you will always fall on your face. That's why the Bible says in Matthew chapter six, verse five and six. Here's the instructions God gave, gave, gave the people of God. And guess what? This is still as good today as it was when it was spoken over 2000 years ago. We need to return back to the Bible. We need to return back to what God says. We need to get on our face. Everybody quotes the scripture. Second Chronicles 7, 14. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he said, I will heal their land. But how many people are turning from their sins? How many people are seeking God by prayer? Not very many today. So in Matthew chapter five, chapter six and verse five and six, look what it said. Jesus said, but when thou prayest, so there's a commandment to pray. It's a choice. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. 
For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street that they may be seen of men. Jesus said, verily I say unto you, they have that reward. What did he mean by that? He means they go out in front of people and they love praying in the crowd. They love drawing a crowd. They like people to pat them on the back after they don't pray because there's some people that can pray some eloquent prayers. I mean, man, they can. It's like it's like honey coming out their mouths, but they have no relationship with God. They have no time with God. They just learn the art of being able to put words together that that have that have no 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 meaning to them. They have no anointing to them. And but everybody else is looking at looking at them as though they next to God. He said they have the reward. Next verse. He said, but you. And me, believers, believers, the problem is you keep going to people before you go to God. You talk about it to people before you talk to God. And therefore, people give you your answer. That's your reward. You still leave that person uh, not knowing what to do. You still don't know what decision to make. And if you base it on man, you're going to always wind up in the wrong place. Number six, look what it says. But thou, when thou prayest, when you pray, when you pray, listen, he said, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, when you have shut the door, you cut off your cell phone. You cut off all outside voices. You done cut off any distractions. He said, shut the door. Pray to your father. Pray to God, which is in secret. That means don't tell nobody. Don't share it with nobody. I'm telling you, it's the most glorious thing that a believer can do is keep it to yourself and go into your closet and tell God about it. And all of a sudden, victories happen to the right. Victories happen to the left. Victories happen in front of you. Victories happen behind you. Why? Because you're trusting in, relying on God Almighty to stretch forth his hand to heal, to win the battle. He says, pray to your father, which is in secret, and your father, which is in, which see it. It says, God see you. I said, Read it for yourself. God sees in secret, he will reward thee openly. So God is looking. In. God is listening, just like he did to Hezekiah. God is listening. When we inquire of God, but how can you come to God if you're not obeying his word? You don't have the confidence. David had confidence. David got up before the Lord. He realized, man, the people about to stone him. He put on the right clothing. He had to repent because he had, listen, before David could go in, he had to atone for his sins. Oh, yeah. David had to offer the sacrifice of cleansing for his sins. Once he done that and purified himself according to the law of the Levites, he could then go into the place of God. Today, you don't have to do that. You don't have to have special clothing. You don't have to have special words. You don't have to have a priestly garment on. He said, when you come in, repent. Turn from your sins, acknowledge them, and then come into the only place where there's peace that pass of all understanding, the joy unspeakable. But remember, when you come in, there's always going to be exposure. So, Philippians 4 and 6, 4, 6 and 7. I want you to read this every day. Every day, I want you to read Philippians 4, 6 and 7. And I'm going to close out. I'm going to close out with uh, Daniel. I'm going to close out with Daniel because I want you to understand the power and the importance of prayer. It's important that we pray. It's important because prayer shows a dependency on God, not on you, not on your ability, not on your family, not on your friends, not on the bank, not on your 401k, not your job. It's, it's totally going to God and, and going to God in secret about your husband, going to God in secret about your wife. Sometimes husband and wives wind up in the most devastating arguments because you're, you're flesh. But can you keep quiet and go into your closet and talk to God about it? If you cry, let it be before the Lord. Let it be before God. If you're feeling grief or, or, or discouragement, go before your father. Stop always telling people. People can't help you unless God sent them. I'm going to say that again. People can't help you unless God sent them. And God won't send them to after you done prayed and sought him. Go to... Um, Daniel. Let's end out in Daniel. I got a few minutes. End out in Daniel. 
end out in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I'm going to give you the synopsis of it. Uh, Daniel at this particular time, uh, him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were taken captive by the Babylonians. And they were brought back to Babylonian. And so the king uh, picked out the best of the Hebrews. And so they picked Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they had certain gifts and talents. But it wasn't just their gifts and talents. It was the, it was the favor of God on their lives because God was going to use them to deliver Israel. But something had happened. And so when in, the, in the sixth chapter of Daniel, you will find that King Darius has set a, a, a presidents over certain aspects of his kingdom. And he made Daniel the, the, the chief president. And so what happened was he made these presidents that if something went wrong in the kingdom, it would never place blame on the king. But the presidents would, would take the hit and not the king because they never wanted to tarnish the character of the king. And so uh, he set these presidents over, but there were other presidents that didn't like the fact that Daniel was a Hebrew and he was above them. And so they conspired. They literally conspired to destroy Daniel. And so they, they, they set out to try uh, to find a means to find fault with Daniel so that they can go back to the king and accuse Daniel that hopefully he will lose his position as the chief president. Go to number four of Daniel chapter six. Let's get to this. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find no occasion, no fault. For as much as he was faithful, Daniel was number one, faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Number six, then said the men, we shall not find any occasion against Daniel, except we find it against him concerning what? His God. They, David didn't have to say who he was. They knew the God that he was serving. Because David uh, uh, put into practice long before anything could conspire, David was seeking God. Daniel was seeking God. Daniel was praying before the Lord. Daniel was crying out before God. I'm going to prove it here in a minute. Number six. And these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said unto the king forever. And so they, they got with the king and got the king to sign a petition that no man should pray to or seek any other God than the God of the king. And so the king signed a decree because the only way they could get to Daniel and try to destroy his reputation and try to get him taken down as president was to destroy him concerning his God. So it wasn't his wealth. It wasn't who he was. It was simply his prayer. Look at this. Go to number Eight. And now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which alter now. You can't change it once he signed it. Number 10. Uh, now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his window being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed. What did he do? Three times. David, listen, David didn't just stop. Daniel didn't just stop praying. He'd been praying uh, even before this even occurred. He was praying three times a day and gave thanks. Listen, he gave thanks for where he was. He gave thanks for his position. He gave thanks that God had given him favor to his God as he did. Listen, the Bible says, as he'd been doing a four time, as he'd been doing. The question is, have you been praying? Have you been seeking God? See, they couldn't find no fault with David. They could only find fault with his God. And what was the fault? He was praying to God. This was a prayer of deliverance. Let me, because I'm running out of time, let me, let me go down a little bit. Daniel was praying long before he had to face this situation. And so because he was praying to God, and they went to the king and said, hey, king, Daniel has broken the decree. You can't change it. Because it's the law of the Midis and the, and the Persians that said, once you sign it, you must follow through with it. And so the king found out that, he had, that they had tricked him and signing the decree, he had to put Daniel in the lion's den. 
Daniel had to go to the lion's den. And they were hoping that the lions would tear Daniel apart. But before, they had already been praying. His prayer of deliverance have already been set. Let's go down to um, verse number uh, 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went and hastened to the den of the unto the den of the lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with lamentation, voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant, he identified, he knew who Daniel was serving. He said, O servant. He said, um, let me, I lost my spot here. Oh. Oh, the voice of Daniel, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, <coughs> whom thy what? Serve. How did he serve God? He served God by obedience. He served God by praying continually. He said, uh, who, thou, who thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions. Then Daniel said unto the king that lived forever, my God. He said, my God has sent his angels and has shut the lion's mouth and they have not hurt me for as much as before his him innocent was found in me and also and also before the old king I have done no harm David said I didn't do anything all I was doing was praying to my God prayer listen prayer preceded David's going into the lion's den and so God protected David he shut the lion's mouth. But in the end, those that conspired against David got their reward. They were thrown into the lion's den. Not only them, but their family, their children, their possessions. They were all thrown in because they went against God's servant. They went against a, 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 a guy who was in God's face. How many times? Three times a day. Every day. Three times a day. Every day. Continually. And even though he knew that the decree was coming against him. And he knew that, that whoever defied the king and his God were thrown into the uh, lion's den. David never stopped praying. David never stopped seeking God. What do we do when we get in trouble? What do we do when the incident happened? The reason why we're fearful, the reason why we fall apart, is simply because we have not established a prayer life. It is essential. It is life saving. It is for your mental stability that you and I establish a prayer time with God. Not just one, one, one time. I don't care if you have five minute prayer, 20 times, five minutes. Get in that place where it becomes familiar to you. Get in that place where you can then distinguish between your voice and God's voice. Stop telling people before you tell God. Stop seeking relief before you go to God. Stop allowing fear, grief, discouragement to come in your life and go before your Lord, before your God. When you get before God, he will strengthen you. If you get before your God, even before the incident happens, God has already prepared the relief. God has already prepared the rescue. But the reason there's no rescue and there's no relief, because the only time that some believers pray is after the incident. It's no good after. You need to have a prayer life long before. Don't fall apart. Don't fall apart. The only reason you're falling apart is because you have not put into practice. Matthew 6. Verse 5 and 6, you have not shut your door. You don't pray to God in secret. So how in the world can you get an answer? You will always be in the land of confusion. You will never hear the Spirit of the Lord because these situations will drown out the answer. These situations will blind your eyes to the hand of God that you will make the wrong decision. It's time to stop. It's time to use, it's time to develop in your relationship with God by having your personal prayer time. Yes, it's good praying with other people. Yes, it's good to have congregational prayer. But congregational prayer will be nothing more than a people meeting with no power until you establish that personal anointed time and fervent prayer with God Almighty. That's what it means to make them first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things that you so desire that God has willed and promises will be in your life. So I want to thank you for joining us this morning. 
my prayers that you would look at these examples. Hezekiah was for healing. David was for recovery. Daniel was for protection. All symbolized by prayer. Our Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed to his father. He prayed, let this cup pass from me. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. You see, when you have a prayer life, you would live a whole new different Christian life. It would be a life of comfort. I'm not saying you're not going to have no challenges. Yes, you are. I'm not saying that people are not going to die in our life. Yes, they are. I'm not saying you might not have financial difficulty. Yes, you may. But if you do, whatever it is, whatever happens in your life, almighty God, the creator of the universe, will keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus and will bring the peace that you need in any situation. Philippians 4, 5, I mean 6 and 7. But if you don't have a prayer life, you're going to wind up in grief, in despair, and sometimes hopelessness, hopelessness and sometimes mental unstableness. That's not where God wants you. Go to your father. He sees your tears. He hears your prayer when you come to him. And you're obedient to his word. You must be truthful with yourself and be truthful with God. If you're not living right, repent. Turn from your sin. Turn from those things that are displeasing in God's sight. Turn from pornography. Turn from adultery. Turn from fornication. Turn from hate. Learn to forgive. Learn to walk in the peace of God by prayer. Learn to get in God's face as much as you can. Be like the widow woman who went to the unjust judge. That was our first teaching on prayer. So I want to thank you for joining us today. I want you to lift up prayer for Minister Forrest and my wife as they continue to go through their healing process. And you know, I always told my wife, God heals at his, at his time, but you're healed. We're going to continue to worship him and continue to magnify him, continue to bless him because we know God is faithful to his word. He's faithful to what he has promised. And so I want to stand on that word and live by that word. But that word will be no good until you start putting into practice and live a life of obedience that we may bring forth fruit to the glory of God. So I want to thank you for joining us. Now, pray our Holy Spirit through me. I'm only a tool. Has said something that's going to help you. That says something that's going to encourage you. That's going to say something that when you don't have no more tears to cry and you're emotionless, that God, because you go to him and you can come freely because of the blood of Jesus, you have access now. You and I, we don't have no excuse. If we don't use the avenue of prayer, we will often find ourselves not in a good place. So enjoy your Sunday. Don't forget to repent. If you're not saved, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he said, thou shalt be saved. Not only saved, thou shalt be rescued. Not only rescued, thou shalt receive eternal life. And if you are saved, but you're not living according to the mandates of God, you're not being obedient to his word, repent. Turn. Stop doing it. Ask God to strengthen you. He fills it with your Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will convict you whenever sin comes to, do to your door. He's there to help you. He's not there to harm you. He's here to lead and guide you into all truth according to the promise of God. So thank you once again for watching Life Change of Faith um, streaming. Hopefully one day we'll be back in this building where we'll gather again. But hopefully much different than it was prior. I pray for you and your families. Pray blessings upon you. God bless you. Thank you for joining today. This will end this morning's service. God bless you. Love you all in Jesus' name. And pray for me as I pray for you. God bless you. Amen. Oh, my thing didn't come up. You went in my book and changed it again for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.
Thank you, Lord God.